So I'm going to have you stand your feet if you have the ability. I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's honor our Heavenly Father as we prepare to receive the word today. Father, we're just so grateful we can come into your house. God, we honor you above all others as our Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for each and every one of us, sending Jesus and loving us, God, when we were unlovable, Lord, and rescuing us, God, when we couldn't save ourselves, Lord. You are a good, good Father, and we praise you this day. Lord, today we're in anticipation and have great expectation as we open your word. We pray that you open us up to receive it, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. Father, we'll do our part giving our interest and our attention, God. We'll take notes, God, and do what we have to do to apply the word in our lives, Lord. We know that you'll do your part. Truly today, God, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. So welcome in this place, Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide, give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, because we know that a loving father disciplines his children, and we know that you do it out of your love, God, so we receive it and we welcome it. God, today also, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel. God, we bless them today as you would bless us. We bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, God, thank you for Calvary Chapel Harvest for Oak Valley, for Ecclesia, God, Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, the way, God, victory in the assemblies and the four square denominations, God, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, too many to name by name, but God, you know each and every one of them if they're preaching your truth, God, lifting up the name of Jesus, we bless them as you would bless us. Also, God, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. Ask that you bless them, protect them, deliver them. God, and Lord, may they endure to the end to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. All right, you can have a seat. Get your Bible out and go with me to Luke, the 12th chapter. This is Breathing Room, part number six. Okay, we got this week and next weekend, and we'll be concluding the series. Today, we're going to be talking about generosity, generosity, and specifically, we're talking about generosity when it comes to our finances, to our money, but as well, it applies to our lives, our time our talent, and our treasure. Why do we talk about this? Sometimes people get mad when we start talking about money, start talking about finances. Well, here's why. is because just in the New Testament alone, okay, this is not even counting the Old Testament verses, but just in the New Testament, where we live today, 2,084 verses talk about wealth, money, and finances. Stewardship, what we're doing with our money. And so if a quarter of the New Testament, one out of every four verses that you're going to encounter is talking about that, we should pay attention. We should listen up because God has something to say about our lives and not just the spiritual side of things, but also the natural and the physical side of things when it comes to what we're doing with what we're spending our time on and with what we're receiving as a part of that. 16 out of the 38 parables that Jesus spoke deal with stewardship, finances, wealth, money. Now, if God puts that much time and attention into talking to us about our finances, we should put that much time and attention into how we deal with it. And so we've learned some things throughout this series. Too much to re, re, uh, review right now. There's a lot of stuff that we could go through, but I would encourage you to get the app on your phone and listen to all the messages or download, podcast, go to the CD counter today if you want to get them on CD, listen to them while you're driving, that sort of a thing. But once we have broken free from that spirit of mammon, that spirit of the world, that rests on money, and we've now introduced our finances to the grace of God by giving without any expectation of return. We started the tithe. That's the place where stewardship starts, is that we bring that tithe, that 10%. Now the blessing of God is on our finances, and when we can start to have a budget, step up to our debt, now all of a sudden the blessings of God are applied to our life. And and if we call this circle right here that I'm making with my hands, if we call that our budget, Then when God starts to pour out the blessing, think about it like a cup, right? The blessing starts to pour out. This is our budget. This is how much we need to live. This is what our bills are. This is what our tithe is. This is all the things that we need. We have the priorities right, the priorities straight. We've stepped up to our debt. We've taken care of those things that are taking away from us now. And now all of a sudden, anything that spills out from this cup is called generosity, right? Because the Bible says you are blessed not just to keep it here, not just to hoard it unto ourselves. No, you are blessed so that you can be a blessing, See, when the cup runneth over, the table gets blessed. Is that right? Think about it. If you had a cup just by itself and water was pouring into that and it just spilled out, that would be a waste. But as you start to gather vessels around it, now all of a sudden that life can overflow into the lives of others. And that's the generous life God wants us to live. 
We see in Luke chapter number 12, there was a man who came to Jesus, and he had an issue. His brother got an inheritance from his father, and he wasn't sharing, so he goes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, tell my brother to give me some money. Now, Jesus steps back, and he says, man, who made me your lawyer? I mean, am I the arbitrator? Am I the, the mediator between you guys? That's not what I was sent here to do. And it's almost as if Jesus recognized from this man's statement, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me, that Jesus takes a moment and uses it as a learning lesson. Luke chapter number 12, starting in verse number 15, take a look at what it says. Luke chapter 12, verse number 15, Jesus is speaking right after he says, who made me to be the judge or the arbitrator? He turns around and he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Now, we don't often use that word covetousness. We're, we're maybe familiar with it. Maybe you've heard in church circles somebody say, I really covet your prayer. So we know that it's like a desire, it's a want that something has. But when Jesus is talking about beware of covetousness, what is he really talking about? What's that all about? Well, uh, I, I would put it to you this way. Uh, if you look up the word, the real definition would be a greedy desire for things. See, here was a man who said, Jesus, tell my brother to give me money. And Jesus says, beware of the greedy desire for things. Look at what the rest of the verse goes on to say. He says, I want you to beware of covetousness. And he says, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So Jesus is teaching a lesson and he says, I want you to realize that your life is not about the stuff that you can accumulate here on the earth. We've heard the saying uh, that he who dies with the most toys wins. But can I tell you something? He who dies with the most toys still dies. You can't take any of it with you. In fact, you can't even take the fillings in your teeth with you. Heard a story about a guy that got buried in his Cadillac. Man, that's a waste of a perfectly good Cadillac. Someone should go dig that up and leave the body there and go drive the car. Because he's not using it, right? He's not in heaven or in hell driving around a car. It's not, it's not the way this works. Life does not consist in the abundance of things we possess. And as if that statement wasn't enough, Jesus illustrates it with a story. He goes on in the next verse and it says he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. So I want you to get this picture in your head. Here's a very wealthy person who has fields. He sows in his fields and then he reaps a very big harvest, okay? Everybody's got that picture in their mind. And it goes on in verse number 17, and he says, And he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. Now look up on the overheads, take a look up here, and notice that I've highlighted the word my. All right, everybody say my. My. Say it loud, say my. 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 So the emphasis here is on what is his. Okay, now I want you to watch for this word my in the next verse. Okay, let's see how many times we encounter it. Verse number 18, so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build together. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. Notice up on the overheads once again, you've got my, my, my. Sounds like a little kid with a toy, right? Mine, 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 mine. That's the attitude of this rich man. It's all about himself. He's got the unholy trinity at work, right? Me, myself, and I is all going on right now. It's all about mine, 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 mine. Look at the next verse. So he said, I will do this, I will pull down my barns, build greater, and there I will store my crops and all my goods. Verse number 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So this guy starts talking to himself. Self, you're pretty cool. You got a lot of stuff. Kick back, relax, enjoy life. Now, Jesus is obviously pointing back to the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon, who is the teacher, the the preacher, who who is wise beyond anyone else's imagination, this guy started to accumulate goods. And he was doing a study on life, and as he started to accumulate things, he realized he had more possessions than everybody else on the earth ever had. This guy was wealthy beyond our imagination. In fact, in Solomon's day, it said that there was so much silver in Israel that they treated it like it was gravel. It was just so common that you'd see silver just lying around on the, on the, on the streets and people wouldn't even pick it up. No, nah, I, I don't need any silver. That's not worth anything. There's so much of it around. So Solomon says, I've accumulated all this wealth. And he says, and I realized it's vanity. It's fleeting. It's going after the wind because here a man accumulates all these goods and then when he dies, it goes to someone else. And he says, if all, all we have is this life and the hope stops here, then why not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? See, that's the attitude of this rich man. He says, I've got a lot of stuff. 
And it's all about me. Therefore, I'm just going to kick back. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Now, let's look at what God has to say about this. Verse number 20, but God said to him, fool. Whoa. That's God's attitude about somebody who's all about themselves and who's just accumulating wealth and storing up possessions. He says, you're a fool. He goes on in the verse and he says, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided. In other words, you sort of all this stuff, you tore down your barns, you built bigger barns, you've got all this wealth, you're kicking back, sipping a cold one, and now all of a sudden you're a fool. Why? Because this night your life will be required of you. You're going to die. And then where's all that stuff going to go? Maybe to probate. Maybe it's going to go to the courts. Maybe it's going to go to people that this guy didn't even know. We're not told if he has an heir, but you know what? If he did, it would go to his kids, right? He doesn't even get to enjoy it because this night... His life would be required of him. See, this is the attitude of somebody. In the next verse, we see, verse 21, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I find it interesting that God equates what we do with our wealth here on the earth with how we act towards him. In other words, Jesus said, if you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me right? So here's a man who stored up goods for himself, and he didn't share with anybody, and the Bible equates that, that he wasn't rich towards God. See, what we do with our money is very important, vitally important, because you won't be trusted with any greater or with the true wealth if you can't handle something else called money, the least of the things that are important. See, God doesn't, it's an abomination, the Bible says, in the sight of God. It's highly regarded among men, but it's an abomination to God. God doesn't care about that stuff. God cares about how we deal with that stuff. Are you listening? That's called stewardship. We're supposed to be generous and be generous towards God. It affects Americans. In Americans, we have this same attitude, right? Get all you can, put it in a can, sit on the can until you kick the can. That's kind of the attitude of a lot of people in our nation. In fact, I, I read about a study that was done at UCLA, and they studied houses, right? They went into people's homes, and they counted how much stuff they had, and they took a look at the different kind of things that they had. And the smallest home in their study was about a 1,000-square-foot, two-bedroom house, okay? Now, they counted the items in this house, and they only counted the items that were in the two bedrooms and in the main living area. They didn't go in the cupboards. They didn't go in the cabinets. They didn't take a look at any of that kind of stuff that was hidden in the drunk drawer or the multiple junk drawers like some of us have, myself included, right? And it showed that in this small two-bedroom house, it held 2,260 items. Of these items, they found 39 pairs of shoes, 90 DVDs, 139 toys, 212 CDs, 438 books and magazines. Now, nine out of the ten houses that they studied and counted their stuff found out that they had so much stuff that they couldn't keep it just in the house, they had to go put stuff in the garage. And out of those nine out of the ten houses that they studied, right, three quarters of those houses had so much stuff in the garage that they couldn't even park a car inside of the garage. Okay, just stare forward, just don't move, and they won't know that pastor's talking about me right now, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, we're all there. We're all there. I know in my, my house, we moved into a new house last year, and there's a room that we have some boxes in. We have not, literally, have not touched those boxes for one year. Honey, it's time to have a yard sale. Let's get rid of it, all right? <laughs> but why? Why do we have so much stuff? In fact, one guy looking at this study called it Stuffocation where we're getting suffocated by how much stuff we have. There's television shows about this, hoarders, right? Uh, I get claustrophobic just watching that because people are unwilling to give. Why? I believe fear holds us back from being generous. We have the thought in our minds, if I give, then I will lack. So it holds a lot of people back from tithing. If I give money, then I won't have money. Oh, no, but you'll have the blessing of God on your life. Which one's more important? Which one do you need more? Money? or the blessing of God, but yet we allow fear to hold us back. See, it's not about how much we've given. It's about how much we've kept that really matters. Uh, Just to lighten up the mood, I know we're getting real serious real fast, but I I just wanted to lighten up the mood a little bit, and I I found an article in the New Republic that talked about a a study, and it's called, uh, it's called, Want to Be Happy, Stop Being So Cheap. That caught my attention right away. 
And they did this study about what happens when we give consistently. In other words, it doesn't happen just one time. You try it out and you get the results. No, it has to be a consistent form of giving. It was so interesting. Uh, they, they, they had a book that came out about it, but the article interviewed the author of the book. And, and the researchers for the study surveyed 2,000 individuals over a five-year period. They interviewed and tracked the spending habits and lifestyles of 40 families from different classes and races in 12 different states. Findings include, check this out, lower depression rates amongst Americans who donate more than 10% of their income to charitable causes. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I think all the tithers in the room, right, real tithers where you give 10% of your income, how many of you could testify, I'm happier now that I'm giving more, right? Look at this, all the, all, all the hands up all over the place. See, th- science has just proven what we already know to be true from the Bible. We didn't need them to do that. We already knew that. We already had the joy of giving. There's just something that happens when you start to be generous, when you open your hand, all of a sudden God starts to bless you. And as you consistently do that, you don't just do little, try it out once. Oh, it didn't work for me. I didn't get the hundredfold return. Listen, that's foolish. There's a seed time and then the harvest comes. And you have to consistently sow, you have to consistently water, you have to consistently do this, and then you get the results. That's the way this works. So we find out that they're actually happier, and then it says that Americans who are very giving in relationships, okay, so not just finances, but in the relationships, in in being uh, uh, emotionally um, available as well as hospitable, these people are more likely to be in excellent health. Isn't that interesting? They were actually healthier because they gave of their time and their lives to others. It actually involves a neurochemical change in the brain that gives people more pleasure chemistry and a sense of reward for having done something good. They said it's actually an upward spiral. In other words, the more you give consistently, the more that you are generous consistently with your time, your talent, and your resources that it will start to reward you and that reward will keep growing in your life and it will be an upward spiral. That's why these people are not depressed and that's why they're probably healthier. It's because the brain is saying, good job, you did very good, you feel good about this and it continues to reward you. Now in the interview for the article, the author stated most people could be more generous. This uh, This isn't a Christian thing. Okay, this is a secular thing. He says, most people could be more generous. They think they don't have the money or the time but they could be more generous. He goes on to say, I think people are afraid. They don't realize it's good for them, that it would benefit them and not just other people. They're afraid that it would be a loss, that if they gave money away or devoted their time, they would be losing something. So part of it is just ignorance, and part of it is fear and insecurity. Now remember, this is for people out there in society. This is for people out there in the world. What about the Christian church? Well, I started to take a look at some statistics and some research about the Christian church. Consider that in 2005, United States Christians, this is counting only people who are members of churches, made well over $2 trillion. This blew my mind when I I, I read this. I I, I can't even comprehend this, okay? $2 trillion, what does that amount to? That's more than the gross domestic product of all but six of the wealthiest nations in the earth. Christians in America made more than the entire world except for six of the wealthiest nations. Okay, that blew my mind. We are so blessed we don't even realize it. We have more than enough that we could share. Goodness. And yet with all that, with all that wealth, the average, average gift from a regular church attender is around 2% nationwide. That's not a tithe, my friends. That's the average and according to one study, 16% of Christians give nothing to church or to charity at all. And we're wondering why we're not blessed. I went to church, I prayed, I read my Bible, and yet we're not being generous. And God's saying, how can I bless that when we know the truth? Luke chapter 12 goes on, and after Jesus says, so is the attitude of someone who's not rich towards God, he starts talking about, don't be afraid. Listen, God clothes the flowers of the field. You don't have to worry about what you're going to wear. And if God can do that to a flower, which most people don't even see, they'll step on it, they'll mow it down, they'll throw it in the fire next day. If God does that for a little insignificant flower, how much more will God take care of your clothing needs? He goes on, he starts talking about birds, right? And he says, the birds don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store in barns, and yet God feeds each and every one of them, and not one of them falls to the ground without God noticing. How much more valuable are you than a bird? God will take care of your food. 
He knows how to feed you. Listen, Elijah the prophet was fed by ravens. Didn't, didn't have to worry about it, right? The children of Israel wandering, probably millions of people in the desert wandering around, and they're fed with the bread of heaven. God can get resources into your hands. If he has to drop it out of heaven every morning, he'll do it. That's the kind of God we serve. But then it goes on, and it says in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse number 31, he says, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Wait a second, I thought we were talking about stuffocation. I thought we were talking about uh, possessions and all that. And I thought they were bad. Listen, it, them in and of themselves are not bad. God is not opposed to you having things. He's opposed to things having you. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. So listen, you don't have to worry about it. They, they'll come. God knows how to get them to you. God knows what you need. God will get resources, resources into your hands. Sometimes he wants to get them to you so that he can get them through you. And he doesn't want us hoarding for ourselves. I've got all my stuff here. You know, the Dead Sea is dead. Why? Because it only receives, it never gives out. But the same river that feeds the Dead Sea feeds the Sea of Galilee, but the Sea of Galilee has inflow and outflow, and that's why it's thriving and living and beautiful. See, it, it, it's a principle in the Word of God. We've got to understand this. We need to be generous. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things shall be added to you. Verse 32, do not fear. Don't be afraid of lack. Why, he says, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you stuff, is that what it says? Give you money? Give you resources? No, much better, right? To give you the kingdom. I, I don't think you guys understand. That'd be like me saying, I'm going to give you a city. Wow. No, not a city. I, I'm, I'm going to give you a province. No, not a province. I'm going to give you gold. Wow. No, not, I'm going to give you the entire kingdom. Come on, somebody. If that doesn't excite you, you need to slap yourself and wake up. Because what resource is outside of the kingdom that you need? All of it is in the kingdom. All the power, all the victory, all the wealth, all the resource, all the strength, all the wisdom, all the knowledge. Whatever you have need of, you will find it in the kingdom of God. And God doesn't say half. No, God says, I will give you the kingdom. My goodness, we reign as kings on the earth. And yet we're living in poverty because we don't realize what God has given us. We're so wealthy and so blessed, and God says, I want you to open your hand and be generous because it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid to give. Look what the next verse says, verse 33. Go into that closet, Pastor Dan, and get those boxes you haven't touched in a year and sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches and nor moth destroys. In other words, I can't take with me the stuff here on the earth, but I can make something that's eternal in the heavens. There is a God account that God has my name on it that when I do good works on the earth, there's something that gets deposited in that account. And while I may not have everything here on the earth, I don't care because I'm not taking any of it with me. It's all going to burn. It all came out of the dirt. It's going back to dirt. And when Jesus comes back, it all burns. But what's in the heavens is unshakable. There's no moth, no rust, no thief that's going to destroy it or steal it. I've got a God account. And when I'm generous and I open my hand, now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, I'm wealthy in the kingdom. Look at the next verse, last verse. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sometimes we wonder, well, God, why are you so far away from me? God, why? I've been praying. I've been reading the Bible. I've been doing all this stuff, you know, going to church. And yet we're so stingy with our money, so close fist, and we say, God's, God's far away. And my heart's just not in it. Here's why. Because you haven't been generous. I've been generous with your time. I've been generous with your talent. I haven't been generous with your treasures. God's saying, open up. Start to release those things, and you have to do it first, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, we've been standing by the fireplace saying, give me some heat, and we haven't put in any wood, and we haven't lit a match. It doesn't work, does it? No. You want the cold air? You've got to go flip on the thermostat to cool and turn the fan on and push the temperature down. Then it blows the cold air on you, right? But what happens? We have to initiate this. If you want your heart in this, then start putting your money where your mouth is. Because where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. So, how do we do this? We need to figure this thing out. How do we do this? Here's how. First of all, we've got to realize God is generous. Isn't he? I mean, God is a good God who gives good gifts to his children, the Bible tells us. God's generous. It says he's lavished his love on us. It says that, that, that God so loved the world that he did what? Oh, that was weak. Come on. Come on. God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his one and only son. He didn't even withhold Jesus from us. So what makes us think he's going to withhold a resource or, or a bill to be paid or some, some money to do something with? See, God, the Bible says he gives us richly all things for our pleasure and our enjoyment. God wants you to have a good time while you're here on the earth. He doesn't want you broke down, busted, and disgusted. God isn't wanting you to be impoverished and dragging your feet, oh, hum. No, God wants you to enjoy life. And God doesn't have a problem with you having things. Like I said, he has a problem with things having you. So God is a giver, and he shows us how to be generous. And we are to live as he lived. Is that right? We're to walk as he walked. So that means if my father is generous and I have his nature on the inside of me, if I've got the DNA of the Almighty and the Holy Spirit of God lives in me, and if he's generous, then that means, I, thank you, I'm generous. Somebody say that loud, I'm generous. I'm generous. Yeah, because I'm acting like my father. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might become rich. Does God want you to be rich? Does God want you to be rich? We have such a problem with that, don't we? Oh, God doesn't want me to be rich. God wants me to be poor. No, Jesus became poor so that you might become rich. Jesus emptied himself. Think about the riches that Jesus had. He was there in the glory of God, disrobed himself and stepped down from that position, that exalted position, to become a slave. He was a servant. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Let me ask you something. In that position where Jesus emptied himself and when Jesus was poor here on the earth walking around in flesh, what did Jesus lack? Where was Jesus' house? He never had a house, right? Right? But he still slept and he still made it. Uh, Jesus missed some meals. You can read that in your Bible. But what did Jesus say to his disciples? They were urging him to eat. They were, here, we've got some food. Jesus, eat. He says, I'm not going to eat. Why? My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. See, God could sustain him without food. He never lacked. How about Moses going up to the mountain 40 days and 40 nights with no food and no water? What did he live on? He lived on the presence of God. See, for your sakes, Jesus became poor that we might become rich. God will provide for us. If he has to drop it down out of heaven, he will, like he did with the manna. So then the next question is this, am I generous? Am I gen if God is generous, if God's a giver, am I generous? Am I a giver? We've got to look in our hearts, and we have to answer this question for ourselves. Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 5, Therefore, put to death in your members that are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, wave the hanky, pastor, amen, yeah, I'm getting rid of that stuff, I'm not going to go watching those dirty old filthy movies anymore, I'm going to break the parental guidance, filthy nasty DVDs and CDs and all that kind of stuff, I'm getting all the, the gross stuff, I'm not going to those websites, I'm getting rid of, listen, that, 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 that thing over there, even though she looked good, even though he looked good, they dragging me down, I'm getting rid of that stuff, right? And we could all say amen, but then he ends the list with covetousness man the greedy desire for things yesterday my mom was in church she said I heard you start that message and I got angry because the Lord was already dealing with me about covetousness guys we are all there aren't we everybody in this room listen it's okay to say amen that's all right it's okay if your neighbor knows that you deal with this because we all deal with it okay just, just Father's Day. Hey, Dad, what do you want for Father's Day? All sorts of covetousness rises up. Wow, what kind of stuff do I want? Right? I felt so guilty this morning. My family's giving me gifts and things like that. I said, I just want to be with you guys. It's not about the stuff. But we have to condition our hearts and we have to combat this. And look at what he says. And covetousness, which is idolatry. 
He defines covetousness as idolatry. Well, what's idolatry? Idolatry is taking something physical and putting it in the place of God and bowing down and worshiping it. In other words, when we have a greedy desire for things and we put things in the place of God, we will end up worshiping things and it will become an idol to us. Put that to death. He says, crucify it with Christ. Take your life. Take that. If you, if you know you're dealing with this, which all of us are, take it to the Lord and say, God, may I not be covetous. And God, I just put that under the blood of Jesus I crucify that on the cross with Christ, and by faith, I declare that I have more than enough. God, you are my source, and God, with an open hand, I will be generous like my Father is. Can you say amen to that? It comes down to this. Do we want blessing or bloating? Hmm? You want to be bloated? I got so much stuff, I'm stuffocating, Right? I got, I, got, I got all of it. I got the whole collection. I, I collected all 12, right? And, and we've got all this stuff, and yet do we want the bloating or do we want the blessing? Blessing, right? I think any Christian would say, I, I want the blessing. Don't, I don't care about this stuff. Give me the blessing of God because the blessing of God is much more valuable than the bloating of this world. And so here the Apostle Paul starts writing, he's talking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse number 35. He says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. In other words, be generous. Give. And he says, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said. So this is not the Apostle Paul speaking anymore. This is what Jesus spoke. This is what God wants for our lives. Jesus himself said these words, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You ever had a friend or a husband or wife or kid or somebody and they mentioned something to you one time, maybe their birthday was coming up like in six to eight months or something like that, right? It wasn't even close. But they said, you know, I, I, I'd like to have something like that someday. And you just got something on the inside of you. I'm getting it for them. They, they're going to be so floored because I'm going to be the one to get that for them. You raced out to the store. You went and you grabbed that thing. You wrapped it up and you sat on that for six months, right? But their birthday came. And you went to that, that closet that you stored it in, right? And you pulled it out of that, that shabby old box, you know, that, that you were storing in so that they would never look in there. And, and you pulled it out of there, and it was in this beautiful package, the bows on it, right? And you take it to them, and, and, and you hand it to them, and you're waiting. And they, they don't realize what it is. They're just kind of like, oh, yeah, I'll get to that. And you're like, no, get to that now. I've been waiting, you know? You, you, can't, you can't keep me in anticipation any longer. Open the gift, I got it for you. And then you're just staring at them, right? Waiting to see the expression of joy and adulation when they open up your gift because you were thoughtful finally, right? And, and it was about time that you did something good. And so here you are, and, and you even got your camera. Everybody got their camera phone out now, and they, they're recording it so that you can watch that same moment of joy and elation over and over and over and over and over and over again. And you're about ready to post it on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat so everybody else can enjoy it over and over and over and over again and you're recording it and they tear it open and they look and they go what's this <laughs> oh I remember I said I want this like half a year ago you got this you're crazy yes I did I just I love you right and 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 what happened See, we, we think, oh, I'm blessed by that. Somebody blessed me with a, a free lunch, or somebody blessed me with a car, or somebody blessed, but yeah, you're blessed, that's great, that's a blessing, but listen what Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. That means when we open our hand and when we're generous, now all of a sudden we have a greater blessing. What is a blessing? It's the power to succeed. We have a greater blessing when we open our hands and when we give to others generously than when we are receiving ourselves. Can you say amen to that? How do I do this? Pastor, I want to be generous. I know God is generous. By faith, I'm saying I'm generous. But how do I do this? How, how do I be generous? Here's how. Plan it. Plan to be generous. You have to purpose in your heart, I am a giver. I'm going to be generous. And then you have to look for ways to do it. Now, sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I can't be generous. I don't have anything. I don't have a lot of money. You know, everything that I have is already tied up. Now you ask me to tithe, I start tithing. It's crazy. All hell broke loose against my finances when I started that. You told me that was going to happen, so I knew. But now I'm suffering lack, and, and you know, I don't really got much. Well, listen, here's how. Plan it. Uh, you making sandwiches for yourself in the morning? Peanut butter and jelly, right? Old PB&J. Nice and cheap, right? Just make two sandwiches in the morning. You say, why two? I only want one. Yeah, but who doesn't have one today? 
So you make two cents. How much did that cost you? 35 cents? Something like that? You already had the bread. You already had the peanut butter. You already had the jelly. So, so I eat this one, and I give this one. Simple. Maybe you started stepping up to your debt and you started doing the envelope system, right? I'm paying everything cash. I'm getting rid of the credit cards that's holding me back and I'm not, I'm not stable or mature enough yet to use those things properly. So I'll get there, but for now I'm doing the envelope. So you have your envelopes, your tithe, you have your offering, you have you know, your bills and all that kind of stuff. You have your entertainment, all that. And get another envelope and put generosity on it. And put a dollar in there. And the next pay period, put another dollar in there. Next pay period, put another dollar and plan. I'm, God, I'm gonna listen for your voice. And God, when you say, Lord, I will take that envelope and I will give. Lord, I'll be generous. Why? Because I'm, I'm ready, I'm planning it. Remember that, that cup, right? This is my budget. Anything that spills outside of that budget with my tithe, my offering, my freedom for our future, my bills, all the kind of stuff, my entertainment, my, my family needs, right? And birthdays and all that, that's my budget. But anything outside of that, God, God, hey, that's generosity. Church has an offering for Israel, I'm gonna give. Somebody tells me they're in need, I'm gonna bless, right? It's more blessed to give than receive. You have to plan it. Isaiah chapter 32 verse eight says, but a generous man devises generous things. One translation says schemes. He's plotting, he's planning, he's, he's you know, wringing the fingers, <laughs> right? He's just excited about his generosity. It says, and by generosity, he will stand. In other words, we think that we're going to lack and we're going to lose, but it says, no, you're not going to lack. You're not going to lose. You're going to stand. Why? Because you were planning on being generous and the Lord's going to take care of you. That's good news. There's three levels of giving that I see. Been confirmed by other men of God as well. Here's the three levels. It starts with the tithe. That's the bottom rung. Then it goes to an offering where you can start doing over and above. And then it goes into extravagant, or I have in parentheses, painful offerings. Pastor Jim reminded me of another great word for this, sacrificial offerings. We've all had those. Pastor Jim gave away a boat. I gave away my first guitar that I loved. But we've all had those times where God asked us to give something that was sacrificial. It was more than we thought that we could handle that threshold. See, if you start at the time, you'll get to the other ones. Why? Because once you start at the time and you start to bless, all of a sudden you've released what's in your hand, you've unlocked the principles of God, and now God opens up the windows of heaven, pours out a blessing on you so much so that you can't contain it, and now out of that all of a sudden you say, well, I, I can tithe, but now I got more than, I can start giving an offering. I, I can do this freedom for our future thing. I, I can do this special missions. I can do this. I, I can go for it. And then there will come a time where the Lord whispers in your ear, and he says, I want you to give generously. I want you to give this. And your heart's going to do one of two things. I'll let you know what they are. It's either going to leap. Wow, I'm so excited. God, finally, thank you. Or it's going to sink. You want me to what? Okay. Now, whatever the case is, whatever happens, just do it. Just go and do it. Why? Because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You could give away everything you have and God would still be able to restore you and give you more than that back in a day if he wanted to. So what do we see this in the Bible? We see King David provided from his own treasures for the building of the temple. What today's equivalent of $21 billion would be. Whoa, how many of you would say that is an extravagant offering, even though he had the amount to pay for it? That, that's pretty extravagant, $21 billion to build the house of God? Wow, that's pretty amazing. Well, how about Mary? Brother Lazarus dies, right? Mary's brother dies, and Jesus comes to raise him from the dead. They're sitting at the table having a good time, chopping it up, right? Lazarus is there, and here comes Mary, and out of a grateful heart, see, generosity comes from a grateful heart because we know that God was generous to us, and we know that we were dead and God made us alive. So out of that generosity, she comes, and she has a very costly oil of spike and she breaks open that alabaster jar, and she pours it out on the feet of Jesus and wipes it with her hair, and she's crying all over him. And all of a sudden, how many of you know when you do something good, people start hating on you? Right, the religious people start getting in the funk and they're like, well, what? what's this waste? This could have been sold and given to the poor. They didn't care about the poor. They cared about themselves. They were wanting to steal it. And so what does Jesus say? He says, leave her alone. Because she did this for my burial. You know, Jesus didn't have another anointing for his burial. That was all he got. Because he had a trial by night. He was crucified. He died before 
they could come and break his legs, and it was the Sabbath day of preparation, so they had to take him quickly down off the cross so that they could enjoy the Sabbath. And then afterwards, he had already raised from the dead when they came back to finish the job. So he never got another anointing for his burial. All he had was the anointing that Mary gave him. And, and think about this. There was a reward that came to her as well, right? Jesus says, what she has done will be spoken of all over the world wherever the gospel is preached. To this day, we preach about what she did. And that's the reward. See, you can't put a price on that. Honor from God. Think about the treasure she has in heaven. Now that, that alabaster box that she broke open and spilled out on the feet of Jesus, that is estimated to be about a year's wage. So what is your yearly gross income? Think about taking that and just spilling it on somebody's feet. That's what she did. How many of you know that was not only extravagant, that was also costly. That was painful. That was sacrificial. There's another lady that we find in the Bible that gave a sacrificial, painful, extravagant offering. It was a widow, right? Here she is and she comes to the temple. Jesus is there at the temple with the disciples and they're over there by the, the offering buckets and they see guys coming by and they're dropping their money in. People are blowing trumpets. Right? They just gave. And here comes the Pharisees in there. Everybody take a look. And they drop it in. And then here comes a little widow. Pulls out two copper coins. The widow's might. She takes that she drops it in the offering, and she starts to walk away. No trumpets, no elation, no joy, no sound. Nobody notices except Jesus notices. And what does he do? He calls a staff meeting right there at the offering. Box. Hey, boys, come over here for a second. See that lady right there? She gave two copper coins, more than everybody else. What are you talking about, Jesus? Two copper coins? That's like I was saying, two pennies. You know, I didn't have two cents to rub together. She had two cents. That's all she had, and she gave it. She didn't give more. They, she only gave two pennies. They gave 1,000 over there. He gave 10,000. But when you start to take a look at percentage, he gave 5%. He gave 10%. She gave 100%. She left them in the dust. That was all that she had to live on. That is pretty extravagant, wouldn't you say? That's pretty sacrificial. So what is the effect what happens when we're generous? Now, I don't want to go too much into this because next week we're talking about multiplication, all right? And that's just awesome. So next week, you don't want to miss next week. But what's the effect of generosity? Proverbs chapter 11. Turn there with me in your Bible. I want you to see this in your Bible. Proverbs chapter number 11, verse number 24 and verse number 25. Create a set of verses in your Bible. Take a look at it with me. Proverbs chapter 11, starting in verse number 24. It says, there is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Do you know that God's math is not our math? His ways are not our ways. See, God has a math that we, we say, God, if I give, I'll lack. If I'm generous, I won't have. But God says one plus one doesn't necessarily equal two when it comes to God. And 10 minus one doesn't necessarily mean nine when it comes to my math. So there's one who scatters and yet increases all the more. There's one who withholds more than what is right. Somebody's holding on to that one. Someone's holding on to that two. Someone's holding on to that ten. And yet it says it leads to poverty. Verse 25, the generous soul will be made rich. Guys, I didn't write this. You didn't write this. So if you by the world's standards are rich, which we all are, then we need to start being generous, don't we? Because we may not think that we're rich, but when you do, the true riches of the kingdom, not just money. Money is the least of all that. People, faith, the word of God, which is eternal, we will be enriched in all things. We will be so blessed that we won't even be able to comprehend everything that God is doing in our lives. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered Himself. Let me read this to you in the message paraphrase. I love how it says it in the message. It says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller, just like that episode of Hoarders, right? Why? Because they've got so much stuff, they're getting stuffocated, and it keeps 
creeping in, the walls keep closing in, and the world of the stingy just gets smaller and smaller, and they won't have people around them, they won't have faith, they won't have the blessings of God, and they'll forget the word of the Lord. See, but when we start to be generous and open our hands, our world expands. It just gets larger and larger and larger and larger. It goes on in verse number 25, and it says, the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed, and those who help others are helped. That is the effect of generosity. Let's open our hands. Let's give generously. Let's start with the tithe, move up to the offering, and then let's start listening for the voice of God for those extravagant, those painful at times, but those sacrificial offerings. I want everybody to just take a moment. This is not time to leave, not time to get up. Just take a quiet, private moment with God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to answer this question in your heart. What is God speaking to me? What's God saying to you right now? Just listen for his voice. What is God saying to me? Maybe he's already said it in the message. He might have told you it's time to trust me. Time to step out. Start tithing. He might have brought back up last week's message and said, hey, you need to take care of that debt. It's time to be a wise steward. Maybe today he's put on your heart something generous that you need to do. Some of you guys, he might have talked to you about next week, finishing strong with freedom for our future. Whatever it is, just, just get a hold of that word that the Lord spoke to you. Now, if, if you have a pen or paper, if you have a, you know, a little tablet or your phone, something like that, write it down. Okay, that way you can remember it. Just take a moment, write it down. Get, get, it's okay, get out your notes. Get, if you already put away your Bible and your pen, get it out, write it down because you're gonna forget, all right? I have to write stuff down, otherwise I'll forget it. Write the date, write what it is. If you're here with your husband or wife, just whisper in their ear, God just spoke this to my heart. That way there's accountability. Maybe you have a friend that you're here with that you trust. Ask him, can I, can I tell you what God just spoke to me? There's accountability now. Now that you've spoken it, now you're responsible for it. And they're going to lovingly remind you and encourage you to complete that and to continue on with that. Okay? What is God speaking to you? Now, let's be diligent to do it. Amen? Did you guys get some from the word of the Lord today? Amen. That's good. Hey, before you leave, before I let you go, okay, got a couple more minutes, then I'll let you go. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. And that if you died, that you don't end up in hell, but that you end up in heaven with God forever and ever. Now listen, lots of people getting up, lots of people leaving right now. I hope for your sakes that you're right with God. If you don't know, stop right where you're at and listen up. It's worth fighting traffic for an eternity with God. And I want to make sure you don't end up in hell. Listen, you want to make sure you don't end up in hell. But more than both of us, God wants to make sure. And that's why he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. He said, you don't have to go to hell. You can choose with your life while you're here. God loves us so much, he gives us the free will choice to choose with our life where we end up, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. You say, but I don't believe in hell, Pastor. Well, it's in the Bible. Old and New Testament, Jesus himself spoke about it, so you're going to have to face the reality of it. Let's make sure you don't end up there. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven now that Jesus has gone to the cross and therefore I can do whatever I want, you can do whatever you want. The church is out there, they have their own systems, their own ways. We'll all end up there somehow, some way, as long as we stay true to ourselves. Well, listen, you know the Bible never says stay true to yourself and do whatever you want to do. Let's apply that logic to the earth for a second. What if I told you all roads lead to the moon? You'd say, you're crazy, you can drive around the earth as long as you want and you'll never make it. So what makes us think that that same logic applies to spiritual things with the Bible and with heaven? Just do whatever you want to do and you'll end up there. See, the road is not wide, it's not expansive. Jesus said the road is narrow. That leads to eternal life. And there are few who find it. Today, let me shine some light on the path for you. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Now, you might be thinking, well, pastor, that's cool because I know God's way is by being good. I've been a really good person all my life, done a lot of good deeds. Yeah, I used to be bad, cleaned up my act. 
I've been really good lately. In fact, I think I finally tipped the scales. My good outweighs my bad. And I think I'm going to get to go to heaven because I've been really good. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can earn your way into heaven by being good? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there is a merit that gets you into heaven where you can be good enough or your good outweighs your bad. There's a line or a grading scale, a curve that you have to be above in the back of the Bible behind the maps. It doesn't work like that. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it to heaven just by being good. You might be thinking, well, okay, I understand that, Pastor, but I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? They took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You've always considered yourself to be a Christian. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions, therefore we're Christians, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that you are a Christian? It doesn't matter how much religious activity you did, how much jewelry you wore, t-shirt that says Jesus or a tattoo that says in him. Listen, that's not going to get you into heaven. And just because you're born in America or because you're not some other religion, God doesn't just lump you into the category of being a Christian by default and say, yeah, you can go. Listen, can I love you enough today, respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games? You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. So you say, well, pastor, I understand that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church right now. And I consider myself to be a Christian because I'm sitting here in church. Well, I'm glad you're here today. Praise God. But that doesn't make you a Christian just because you sit in a church service and call yourself a Christian. It's like me saying, I really want to be a car. I go to my garage and I sit down in my garage and I call myself a car. Listen, just a crazy dude sitting in his garage doesn't make me an automobile. I can make honking so- sounds, rev up my engine, all that kind of stuff, wear a shirt that says Honda. It doesn't matter. Still not a car. You can't just sit in church and call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. So you might be thinking, okay, oh, I, I understand that, but you don't understand. My last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Logged up a lot of hours volunteering at that church, even got a membership card. That's great. Show me in the Bible where God's looking for volunteer log sheets and your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to make it by religious activity, volunteering, or getting a membership card. So he said, but I know God, I I, I know about Jesus, celebrate the resurrection at Easter, sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor, and while that's great, and I'm glad you could do those things, show that to me in the Bible. In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you know demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. Don't let anything distract you right now. People are getting up left and right, don't even realize they're headed for hell. Focus in, because your eternal life is at stake. This is not about what you have in your head, not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. This is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to one of those religious leaders we were talking about before. He was a Pharisee. He held to the strictest form of the law, did a lot of good deeds. People looked to him to find out about God. And yet, when Jesus speaks to this guy, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, you're doing such a good job, just keep it up and I'll see you in heaven. Rather, what does Jesus say to him? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. That's simple. You must be born again. Now, you might be thinking, ew, oh, wow, you just went there. I I, I saw that in a movie. I read about that on the internet. You know, there was a blog about that. I don't want to have any part of that. That's weird. Listen, if you don't have any part of it, you won't have any part of the kingdom of heaven. Today, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You must. Not should, maybe, kind of, hope. No, you must be born again. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, that's pretty gross, pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. 
So today is your call, your choice. Here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll hear your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks you're dumb. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. You tell that devil, go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God today. Now listen, you're amongst friends and family today. We love you. No one's criticizing, judging, or condemning you. We're excited for you today. We want you to do this. Praying for you right now. There's people praying for you right now. Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before? Come on, this is your time. This is your moment. Let's go on with God today. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out watching by television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, put the burger down. Time to get your hand up. Then you can tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service if you're nearby. If you're online and you're raising your hand right where you're at, that's good. God sees. Then minimize your video browser and click the button that says respond to God or go to our homepage, rockchurch.com and find the tab that says how to know God and someone will lead you in a prayer right now. Come on, let's get ready to get our hands up. If that's you, you need to do this. Get ready. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. There's five. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? There's five wise people. There's six. Got you right there. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Five or six wise people. Who else today? Six wise people. There's seven. Got you over there. There's eight. Got you back there. Thank you. Who else today? No, you need to give God all of your heart. No, you need to give God all of your life. This is your time, and this is your moment. Anybody else real quick, just raise it up high for me right now. If I didn't already see your hand, just get it up and give me a little wave if that's you right now. Anybody else real quick, know you need to give God all your heart and all of your life. That's you. Don't wait any longer. This is your time. This is your moment. Your heart's beating out of your chest. You're saying, I wonder if you should. Yeah, you should. Thank you. Got you way in the back. Thank you. Got you back there. That's number nine and number 10. Got you right there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Get ready to get your hands up just when I'm looking in your direction, if that's you. I'm going to do one more sweep, then I'm going to close this thing up. Don't miss this opportunity, if that's you. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 10 wise people. All right, all 10 of you, number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. That's your cue. Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Coat, purse, sweater, Bible, Fred, if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. If you're sitting next to somebody that raised their hand, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. If you're in the family room and you want to bring your children because they raised their hand, hey, they're welcome at this time. Or you raised your hand, but you, you got your kids with you, bring them. They're welcome during this time. All right? Wherever you're at, even if you didn't raise your hand, you're welcome right now. Come on, let's all stand and welcome them. No one leave. Let's let them come forward right now. You come right now. Come on down to the front. If you raise your hand, you should raise your hand. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. They're still coming. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Wow, they're still coming. Whole families are coming. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment. You can come too right now. Make your way to the front. There's room for you. They're coming. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. Let's encourage them. They're still coming. Amen. Hey, everybody up front, look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? Came to give God all your heart and all of your life. Going to be born again brand new. 
That's awesome. All right, right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel waving at you. Really good guy. Nothing weird goes on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Like, are they going to show me their socks or something like that? Okay. He's cool. He's not going to do any of that. All right. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance. He's going to do three things. First thing, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing, he's going to do, give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. This is generous church. All right. And so he's going to give you that free information, free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then finally, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. All right, come on, friend. There, hey, you guys are welcome. Come on. This is awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Man, this is awesome. Okay. Spiritual personal trainer will help you get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to the old ways, serving the devil. You go on with God for the rest of your days. It'll help you to just get strong, grounded in the faith, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as he go. Woo! Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Amen.